Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Welcome everyone to Sports Spectrum. I'm Jason Romano. It's great to have you joining us here today on the show. Really excited to talk about leadership with author and pastor Clay Scroggins. Before we get to our conversation with Clay, I want to tell you about our website, our magazine, and our ministry at sportsspectrum.com. That's the website. Bookmark the website. But really want to encourage you to subscribe to our magazine. As we get near the holidays now, we're into November, thinking about an idea for a Christmas present or a holiday present, just a birthday present, or any kind of gift, really. Consider the Sports Spectrum magazine. It's just $18 for an entire year, $18. So get two or three subscriptions if you're if you're feeling like it. And it's something that you can give to someone, a tangible magazine that you can hand to someone and tell them and show them about the athletes and the different people in the sports world that are living for a greater purpose, that are living for Jesus. So consider subscribing to the Sports Spectrum magazine. Again, $18 for an entire year. Get you four quarterly issues of the magazine, plus a couple bonus issues. And it's a really great, like I said, a great tool to hand to a kid, to a coach, maybe put it in an office setting, whatever it is, go to a church youth group. You can give them the Sports Spectrum magazine. Go to sportspectrum.com. That's the website, sportspectrum.com and subscribe to the magazine today. Really excited to talk about leadership on the Sports Spectrum podcast. We haven't really delved into that topic too much. We've had John Gordon and a couple other leadership gurus on the podcast, but today we got a guy who knows what he's talking about, and his name is Clay Scroggins. Clay is the pastor of Buckhead Church in Atlanta, but he's also the author of two books, and they're both titled How to Lead, The first was How to Lead When You're Not in Charge. That was released in 2017 and a great tool for really anybody who wants to be a better leader and maybe they're not in a place where they're the president or the owner of their company. And so this was a book that talked about how to lead when you're not in charge. Now Clay's got a brand new book out and it's called How to Lead in a World of distraction. And man, do we live in a world of distraction. We can all go down those rabbit holes on our phone and end up on a thousand different apps and searching for things and completely lose touch with everything going on. So Clay writes this book called How to Lead in a World of Distraction. And it was really great to dive into some of the principles that make a great leader. Take a listen to Clay Scroggins, author and pastor here on Sports Spectrum's podcast. Clay Scroggins, welcome to Sports Spectrum. Thanks, Jason. I'm a longtime listener, first time caller. It's great to be great to be on. I love what you're doing. I love Sports Spectrum. Uh, I am a sports fanatic, so it is yes. so fun to get to t- uh, blend the two worlds for me of getting to uh, write and talk about leadership stuff, and then also uh, getting to talk sports. So I, I love incredible. it. You, you went first, long time listener, first time caller, which speaks to my heart because that's sports talk radio. <laughs> that's and it's, right, and it's core right there. So that's right. that was awesome. Let's let's start actually with your city though, because you're in Atlanta. Yeah. And you're pastoring a church yeah. there, but yeah. I presume you're an, an Atlanta sports fan. Which, if you're admitting that, it's just asking misery into your life. It sounds like in the last couple yeah. of years. It has not been easy to root for these teams in Atlanta, has it? No. We won the MLS Cup last year, Atlanta United. Yes. And we are holding on to that win (laughs) like it is all we have to – I mean, that Falcons-Patriots Super Bowl, I still am not over. Uh, Are you a Patriots fan? I am not. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, so I have my own own misery to deal with, but I I know what you're saying. (laughs) Yeah, that that Falcons, that that was atrocious. I mean, still hurts 28 to three at halftime. The Braves, I mean, we can't make it past the first round this year. Our collapse in the first inning at the Cardinals is brutal. Uh, The Hawks, uh, I love what they're building, but we're still a ways away. So, yeah, so it's soccer. We're a soccer town, man. Who knew it? But we are one. It's it's so crazy. I remember we had, uh, I know you know him pretty well, Louis Giglio on uh, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago. It was right after the Falcons 
Patriots Super Bowl, and he wasn't even prepared to talk about it. And it was no. six months later, and he still wasn't yeah. over it and couldn't get over yeah. it. And I, I, I get it as a sports fan. I, it, it, it's hard to talk about those crushing defeats that we've all experienced crushing. in sports. But, yeah. Yeah. but have I, I see something different that's happened with the Falcons. It feels like they've just gone downward since because the team that right now, yeah. and we're running this in about a month from when we're taping it, it's mid to late October, but the team that they have right now isn't much different than the one that was up 25 points in the Super Bowl to the no. you know the dynasty of the Patriots, and they're, they're just struggling right now. Football's weird yeah. and sports is weird. What's your take on just, you know, trying to overcome and move on from that game and just not being able to find any positivity right now with those Falcons? It's tough. Yeah, I, it is tough. And I don't know how to explain it, but it, it is like Belichick and Brady just ripped the Falcons heart out, stomped it into the grass. And we just still haven't picked up yet from it. I don't know. We have not bounced back. It's, um, yeah, it's 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 pretty brutal what has happened. It feels like the wheels have come off, and uh, we're at, yeah. As 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 we record, we're it seems like we're starting to dismantle the team and trade off the pieces and prepare for the future, uh, like the Miami Dolphins have done, I guess. Yeah, and that's the hardest thing to do if you're going to do a uh, a sort of reboot with your team. You don't want to kind of go halfway in. It's just like, well, just do it then. Yeah. Just just that's right. Launch that's right. everybody out. Let me talk. Let me ask you about your love for sports. You said you're a sports yeah. fanatic. What role, maybe growing up and even into now, has sports played in, in your life? Where does that fandom come from? Yeah. Well, I grew up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, so they um, they play a lot of football there. Yes, they do, um, and they win a lot. <laughs> they win a lot there. They do enjoy winning. I, uh, yeah, I just grew up in a family of a lot of coaches, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of hustlers, um, and a lot of high school sports. Uh, as far, that's as far as the road has taken most people in our family, but we've got a couple small college athletes in our family, but uh, I just grew up playing team sports, loved it, loved the team aspect. Uh, I, I've always wanted to be a leader and I wanted to be a leader probably even more than I wanted to be an athlete. And so sports really gave me a platform to express leadership, um, which I, that's probably what I loved most about it. So I was most likely to, um, I, I, I was more likely to get voted team captain than MVP for sure. Hmm. Um, but I, uh, yeah, it's just played a huge role in my life. And I, even in college, I played I uh, went to Georgia Tech uh, right before their Final Four run of 2004, but then I caddied at Eastlake Golf Course, so around a lot of golf, and um, still get a chance now to do. I've uh, done some stuff with most of the pro teams in the Atlanta area, talking about leadership stuff, and then done a bunch of stuff with colleges as well, athletic departments, just being able to talk about leadership, particularly the first book, How to Leader Not in Charge. Uh, that content. It just it's so applicable to any player on a team because clearly they're not in charge. But also even coaches, you know, coaches are not really they're in charge of their team, but they're not in charge of the athletic department. And so oftentimes there's a feeling of, oh, if they only gave us more money, we'd be able to win. Or if they only gave us the uh, facilities we needed, we'd be able to win. And I've just learned more and more leadership's not about the authority that you have or don't have. It really is about your ability to cultivate influence. Uh, to get people to do what they don't want to do to accomplish what it is they want to accomplish. Now, this might seem like the easiest question. Maybe it's the hardest question. Define what you would say is a leader. What's your definition of just a leader? Yeah, that's a great question. I do think, you know, we rise and fall on our definitions. And so (laughs) uh, we really do. And this, this, that, that's what got me started on this road. I'm in the middle of an organization. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, to put it in corporate terms, I'm in mid-level management. I'm a campus pastor at an organization that has about 600 employees, and we've got seven churches in the Atlanta area. And so I lead our location, but I'm I, I, not stuck. Stuck's a negative word, but I'm I'm just kind of smack dab in the middle of the organization. I have some people that I'm in charge of, but I'm not in charge of the whole thing. Right. So when I think about leadership, I think of one word. I just think of influence. Leadership is influence. Leadership is the ability to move someone, the ability to change someone's mind, persuade someone. The ability to cause someone to move to action, uh, that's its influence. And it, that's very different than authority. Authority is I've got the title. I've got the parking spot. I've got the, uh, I've got the corner office. I've got the bathroom in my office. Uh, but we all know there are people that are in authority that aren't leading well. And then vice versa. There are people that don't have any authority 
that are leveraging, they're cultivating influence and they're leveraging influence to be able to cause people to move, cause people to do something that they never thought they could do to accomplish something great. It's a great definition. Clay Scroggins is our guest here on Sports Spectrum. It's funny, I'm in the midst of writing a leadership book as well, um, which will be out, at, I guess, at the end of April of 2020. And the one thing I've learned is you don't, you mentioned this kind of in the way that you answered your middle management, but I've seen people who are in the lowest rung, if you want to classify them that based upon yeah. their roles yeah. in an organization be great leaders. And yeah. I just wonder for you what you've seen that makes a great leader for someone that might just be in a role that they might, I'm just the cashier at the grocery store. How can I be a great leader? I'm just a, you know, a receptionist or whatever. I'm not trying to classify different jobs, but they're not defined as leadership roles by maybe what their title is, but you can be yeah. a leader really wherever you are, right? That's exactly right. I think we grow up with the lie that if you're in charge, you're a leader. If you're not, you're not. And that's just not true. But of course, we believe that, you know, the coach is in charge, the bus driver's in charge, the teacher's in charge. Uh, But as we get older in life, we start to realize, to your point, that you can, you know, I've seen interns come into a team and change the culture of a team. So when I think of leadership, I really think of four behaviors. Uh, Number one, the ability to lead yourself. That's your primary responsibility in leadership, and great leaders lead themselves well. You don't have to be in charge of everything to realize that you're in charge of something, and what you're most in charge of is yourself. And if you can't lead yourself well, how can you lead anything else? So uh, first attribute of a great leader to lead yourself. Second one would be to choose positivity, to be able to say, hey, you know what? The greatest impact I can have on the people I'm around is not my education. It's not my skill level. It's not my talent level. It's not my experience. It's not my expertise. No, the greatest opportunity I have to affect change in someone's life is through my attitude. Yeah. And attitude really is everything. I mean, that's a that's kind of in some ways become a cliche in sports, but it has never been more true that attitude really is everything. And choosing positivity uh, is a powerful choice that we have the opportunity to make every single day. Uh, thirdly, uh, great leaders think critically. They, they bring value they're not, they haven't just turned their brains off. They're not robots just going, Hey, we're just going to say yes to everything that happens. I think about, uh, uh y- your daughter is probably too old to still watch animated movies. Probably. Right. Uh, she's 15. So yeah. it's hit or miss, but I like to watch you, them and she yells at me when I'm okay. watching them. <laughs> you, do you, you remember the Lego movie, the original Lego movie? Oh yeah. Well, not any of the new spinoffs. I love that song that they sing in that planned society, you know, they walk around singing, everything is awesome. Yes, bop, 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 bop. I think a lot of times we think about positivity in that way, that am I supposed to just walk around and go, this coach is awesome. This AD is awesome. Our school is awesome. We lost on Saturday, but it's still awesome. Yeah. No, because we're here to make something better. We're here to improve something, to bring value. And so great leaders have the skill of thinking critically, uh, realizing that, Hey, what's in front of me is only going to get better when I apply my mind, when I think about how can I bring value, add value to what I'm working on. And then lastly, to reject passivity, great leaders reject the idea that just because I'm not in charge doesn't mean that I can't be proactive. And that's one of the curses of not being in charge. You get everything handed to you, uh, but great leaders know how to say, Hey, you know what? Even if it's the closet that I'm in charge of, I'm going to make it the greatest, most clean, most organized closet. It's going to be my oasis of excellence. And I'm going to reject the idea that uh, I've got to be passive just because I'm not in charge. So leading yourself well, choosing positivity, thinking critically and rejecting passivity, I think, are attributes of not just a great leader, but a great leader who's not in charge. I love that. And that's your first book, How to Lead When You're Not in Charge. This, the newest book, the one that actually is the reason why we're having you on right now is awesome. I just finished reading it, uh, How to Lead in a World of Distraction. And so what was the meaning behind this book? Because I think anybody who looks at this book, I was actually in my office a week ago in Colorado with the team and somebody there broke the book out and said, hey, look at this book. And I said, I'm about to interview that guy. And Ah, it was perfect timing because we do live in a world of distraction on every level. Every level. So talk about the book, why you wrote it and why this topic was so important for you. Yeah, I really, um, I have come to love the concept of leading without authority and I've gotten the opportunity to talk to so many different people about it. And it's just been a blast to carry that message. But that first idea of leading yourself well is so important, specifically in your internal life, your, your inner world, 
your emotions. Uh, Daniel Goleman, the father of emotional intelligence, he's told us that the best leaders are the most emotionally healthy leaders. All of his research points to the fact that it's not the hard skills of, you know, being able to, you know, keep uh, keep a, a P and L, being able to run a pivot table on a spreadsheet. Yeah. No, it's the soft skills of relationship, knowing what I'm feeling knowing how to regulate my own emotions, being able to anticipate what you're feeling. That's really what makes a great leader is that, that, that emotional intelligence, not IQ, but EQ. And the greatest thing in our way, the greatest obstacle toward emotional growth are all the distractions in our world. Um, I think I realized this, I mean, this is a, it's a political example, but obviously this is no political statement. Uh, But you know, in 2016, when president Trump was elected, uh, there were so many people that, you know, I guess about, you know, 49, 50 percent of the country was outraged. Yeah. And I remember reading headlines of college classes being canceled, mm-hmm. professors canceling class, professors delaying tests. And I remember thinking, man, that is not that did not happen when I was in school. <laughs> no way. I mean, if I went to the professor and said, hey, I'm kind of bummed. The election didn't go my way and I'm not feeling like taking a test. They would say, well, Mr. Scroggins, we're not feeling that you're going to pass this class <laughs> because we're going to have the test. And so we're just we're uh, 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 it, it's unfortunate that we are creating a society. We are now living in a society that is becoming emotionally incompetent, emotionally unaware of what's really going on because we just distract ourselves. I'd rather just turn up the music to cover up what I'm really feeling. I'd rather just look to social media or binge on Netflix or whatever that next distraction is. It's just easier to grab that. You know, I like to think about it, that every single person in the world, when you feel something you don't want to feel, we reach for something. Mm. Whether it's your phone, whether it's the radio, whether it's uh, work, whether it's unfortunately even pastors and ministry can become addicted to ministry to the detriment of their internal soul, their inner world. And so it's really a book on leading yourself well, that the key to great leadership, the key to becoming a great leader is turning down the noise low enough and long enough to be ruthlessly curious of your emotions. You uh, you said something that makes me think of, of the world of football and even specifically the NFL. And we were kind of sharing ideas before we taped this on where we could go through, from a sports yeah. perspective. Yeah. And you said the best leaders are emotionally healthy. And it brought up the idea of NFL kickers and even yeah. college kickers and those that are, yeah. are put, you know, the pressure that's put on them to perform Obviously, all football players, there's pressure to perform, but the kickers sure, have sure. one job. And if they yeah, miss a really unique job, yeah, and if yeah. they miss that field goal late, that could, you know, catapult their team to victory or even tie a game, they are the GOAT on every single level. And the yeah. emotional yeah. side of that has to be difficult. Can you share a little bit more about what you meant by the best leaders being emotionally healthy, especially from a sports yeah, perspective? I, yeah, I have so much sympathy for those kickers because, you know, when I, when I don't, if, if I were to swing and miss on a sermon, um, it's it's evident, but it's not necessarily publicized. There's not a scoreboard right. in our auditorium. You know, nobody knows. Oh, look, clearly he lost. <laughs> um, right. But when the, when the kicker misses the kick, it is so evident that it is it's public. It's uh, it's isolating because it's that individual person. And I've just thought about them lately. I mean, obviously I was a, you know, you're, you mentioned being a Cowboys fan and I, I growing up, I just was, I think because of Cornelius Bennett, the biscuit, uh, oh, yeah. he played at Alabama and growing up in Tuscaloosa, we, we didn't have a pro team. So we were just fans of whoever Alabama players played on. So I was a bills fan when they had that run of not winning any super bowls. Yeah. And I remember Scott Norwood missing that kick against the Cowboys. And I just have felt so much sympathy for them being thinking, how do they clear their head? How does he bounce back from that? How does, you know, Rodrigo Blankenship a couple weeks ago for the University of Georgia missed a kick to beat South Carolina? And I just felt so much pain for Rodrigo because he's a great kid. And I just I'm hoping that he's got it within his system, within his rhythm of his life to turn down the noise, to get the clutter out of his head, to really evaluate, Okay, what does this say about me? And to, to find the strength and the courage to differentiate himself from the miss to realize, you know what? I am not that miss. I am a son of God. God's made me, he's gifted me and I miss that kick, but that doesn't mean I'm a failure. And I think the ability to move forward from failure, the, the ability to bounce back from 
adversity is contingent upon our ability to turn down the noise low enough and long enough to be ruthlessly curious of what's going on inside of us. Now, is it going to hurt? Well, of course it's going to hurt, but we've got to be able to do the work, do the processing to uh, work through those negative emotions of failure and the appearance of failure and rejection and all of those negative emotions that come from failure and adversity. And if we'll do the work, It'll make us better humans. It'll make us better fathers. It'll make us better coaches. It'll make us better friends. And I think ultimately it'll make us better kickers as well. Yeah. If that's what we choose to do for a living. Absolutely. Now I want to get into two two separate audiences that are that listen to this podcast a lot. We're talking about parents and coaches first. And then the second set will be sort of the athletes, the one that are in sports. Yeah. And I want to speak to the parents, certainly a lot of the coaches that listen to this podcast. They're leaders, obviously, in their own places of influence. So sure, start with right. them. Encourage them as they try to lead, teach, coach, whatever it is, especially those younger athletes. I'm thinking about my daughter here who's 15 and those who grew up in this social digital world of distraction. Yeah. Start with them. Yeah. Well, I, I there's so many different angles you can go with. But I what I, I maybe what breaks my heart more than anything is when I see parents living through their kids, when I see parents cheering for the child's last name more than the first name mm. uh, because of what the child does on the field and how that affects them. You know, I think about in uh, w- what was the Napoleon Dynamite, Uncle Rico, you know, who was living out his best life going to go. Hey, I, when I was in high school, I could throw that football over that mountain. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's so many. So many parents and I'm tempted to do it as well. I mean, I've got my eight year old son has got a little league football game tonight and I woke up this morning so excited about it being game day that I, I just have a tendency to live for my own son's little league career. Yeah. And it's in all of us to want to live vicariously through them and to want to measure our own success based on how well our kids do. And if we're not careful, We can start to cheer for the last name of our kids more than we cheer for their first name. And so I'm just, as a parent, I want to be committed to being the kind of parent that says, hey, you know what? Um, I'm I'm going to put pressure on you to work hard and do your best, but I'm not going to put pressure on you to win or lose or perform. And my love for you is going to be contingent completely on not on how you perform. And so we just really worked hard to, you know, when our kids come off the playing field we 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 use that line you know hey i love watching you play football and so my my goal tonight is when he gets done with the game no matter how well he does they call him pancake jake he plays on the offensive line he hasn't had a pancake all year and my 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 hope is that when he gets done tonight uh i'll and I'll be able to just celebrate him and say, hey, man, I loved watching you play no matter how well he performs or doesn't perform. That's a pretty great nickname, though, isn't it? <laughs> it is a great nickname. <laughs> I went to his practice on Sunday and he made a great he made a really great form tackle. Going, man, the coaches were slapping his head. Pancake Jake, Pancake Jake. I love I love it. That is awesome. All right. Now, so speak to the athletes. we got a lot of athletes yeah. that listen to this podcast. I've had many different football players, baseball players on all levels, even a lot of former players that like to join in on this podcast because of the sports and faith aspect of it. But let's talk to them because even though in many ways they may not have a leadership title, which obviously was the the point of your first book, they have a place of influence, some very, very large influences, with you know, hundreds of thousands, even millions of followers on social media. And you wrote about that, obviously leading when you're not in charge, encourage them with some thoughts on leading, living out their calling with these distractions that come, it seems, from every level. Yeah, I think the hardest thing about sports is that it gets so wrapped up in your identity that you become, you know, um, you, you become uh, you become how well you do. That determines your worth or what team you're on or what level you're at. Um, I've got a really great friend that goes to our church named Ronnie Brown, who was a running back at Auburn. Yeah, um, Ronnie. Ronnie was the number two pick in the, in the NFL draft. I mean, he really has... He's been at the every every level of football, and I I've had so many great conversations about Ronnie because he's such a well adjusted adult even after football. And I've asked him so often, man, how have you done that? And he said, I just always had a vision for my life after football. And so I just think the earlier you can begin, not not planning your end. I mean, I think wherever you are, you got to as Colossians three twenty three says, you got to work heartily as for the Lord and not for man. You've got to work heartily as for God. You got to do everything you can do, give as much effort as you can give. 
but you got to remember that every single one of us has a road that's going to end. Mm. And, and my, my road ended in the 12th grade. It really ended it probably about in 10th grade, but <laughs> I was on the team even through 12th grade, but you know, your road might end after, you know, small college ball. It might end after minor leagues. It, you might make it to play professional sports, but eventually your road is going to end and you are going to have a life after sports. And so the earlier you can begin to define your identity based on who God says you are and not on what you do, the better it's going to prepare you for life after sports. And better than that, the more influence it's going to give you while you're in the middle of sports, because what our world needs more than anything is a, a, a light on a hill, a city on a hill that's set apart that says, I know who I am. I know who my audience is. I know who I play for and I know who determines my worth. And if you can go ahead and answer those questions now, uh, it'll just set you up so much better for success later in life, but it'll also give you more influence uh, exactly where you are right now. Clay Scroggins has been our guest here on Sports Spectrum. We close every podcast, Clay, with the question of what are you learning from God today? So you're a leader, you're writing books about leadership, but you also are a person that is learning from a lot of people. But yeah. most importantly, you're learning from God. So what is the Lord teaching you uh, right now where he has you in this season of life? Yeah, he's teaching me the the art of reframing, of learning how to reframe specifically. Um, I work in an organization that, you know, every organization has constraints. And so we've got financial constraints. We've got facility constraints. We've got leadership constraints. But at the same time, I feel like God's put vision inside of my heart and I, it's so easy when you express your vision, when you try to live out your vision to hit a dead end and to think it's a dead end and to hear the word no, but I'm learning the art of reframing no to not yet. Mm. And I think it's part of the resilience that God gives us. You know, I love that verse that James began James with consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kind that when I get a no, I just see it as, you know what? All right. That's not a dead end. It's like those little mazes that we do when we're kids, you know, where we bump the line and then we go, okay, we got to turn around and go the other way. I just got to find another way. And so I'm just determined to be like that little mouse that says, you know what, I'm not going to take no for an answer, but I'm going to just reframe no to being not yet because I'm just convinced that if God has put this inside of me, this vision, um, he's going to not only equip us to see it through, but he's also going to be the one to finish that work. And he might do it in a different way. Um, he might do it in a way that I, uh, surprises me, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to be the kind of follower of Jesus that says, I'm not going to take no for an answer. I'm going to reframe it as not yet because, um, what it does is it, it allows me to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, well, I need a new approach. I've got to change my approach. I've got to come at this a different way. I've got to get, I've got to get more data. I've got to build a different team. I've got to, I've got to get a better way to say it. And I'm just not going to take no, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to reframe no to not yet because I believe that God is in this and I believe he's the one that's going to see it through. And I think it's just, uh, it's building resilience in me. Uh, but I think it's making me a better leader as well. That's a great answer. And no to not yet is, is really a great mindset because it's, listen, stuff happens in our life and we have to either be able to, uh, you know, understand how it's going to define us or if it's going to refine us. And that's a really oh, great, great, really great um, nugget there, Clay. Thanks so much for being Thank here on the show. Again, the new book is called How to Lead in a World of Distraction, Four Simple Habits for Turning Down the Noise. And man, we all need to turn down the noise a little bit in our lives. So go get this book. It's a really good one. Clay Scroggins, you're the best, man. Thanks so much for being Thanks, here. Thanks, Jason. We'll talk to you soon. Really honored. Thanks, man. Great stuff there from Clay Scroggins. You can check out Clay on Twitter. And again, the new book is called How to Lead in a World of Distraction. Clay's got some great stuff. You might want to go back and listen again and bring a notebook or or something to take those notes on. Maybe open up the notes app on your phone and take down what he had to say. Because I thought those four principles that he talked about in, in terms of being a good leader were key. Leading yourself, choosing positivity, thinking critically, and rejecting passivity. Clay Scroggins, man, get the books that he's written, How to Lead When You're Not in Charge, and How to Lead in a World of Distraction. Clay Scroggins. Thanks to Clay for joining us here on Sports Spectrum. Also want to apologize for the audio, especially on my end. We were taping this on Skype. I'll give you a little peek behind the curtain. And I had the wrong audio 
um, clicked, I guess, on Skype. So it doesn't record my microphone. It records the microphone from the computer. Probably a little too inside info, but I try to be as pa- as transparent as I can with you all. And it really was not salvageable for me to try to overdub my voice with a normal microphone. So that's what it was. But I still thought, man, this is too good of an interview and really good stuff from Clay here to to pass up. So really happy that he was able to join us and talk some leadership here on Sports Spectrum. I want to thank you for listening. You can subscribe to our podcast. Click that download button, that subscribe button on whatever app you listen to podcasts on and never miss an episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast. Over a million downloads, over 400 episodes of the Sports Spectrum podcast. And we're so grateful to you for listening. If this is the first time you've ever heard of the Sports Spectrum podcast, thank you. We really do appreciate you tuning in here at Sports Spectrum. Want to direct you to our website, sportspectrum.com. That's where all of our content can be found, including every podcast, a daily devotional every day at 6 a.m. Eastern to start your day right with God. And then articles all day long on the intersection of sports and faith. As I said in the beginning of this podcast, we also want to encourage you to subscribe to our magazine and help the ministry out here at Sports Spectrum. It's just $18 for an entire year. 20 bucks basically gets you a subscription to the Sports Spectrum magazine. Four issues, our quarterly magazine, plus a couple bonus issues, some really great content, some rich content found in those magazines, wonderful pictures, great storytelling. Get the Sports Spectrum magazine. Subscribe today over at sportspectrum.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time with a new episode here on Sports Spectrum's podcast. I hope you have a great rest of your day.